All right, good morning, everybody. So, 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 so glad that you are here today. We're gonna get right into it. Our big idea this morning, we're gonna frame our talk with a question, and it really is this. How is Satan still dividing households today? I know I kind of might feel a little bit out of left field, but we're gonna jump back into our text in Mark chapter three, uh, because there's some stuff happening under the service I don't wanna miss, and I feel like God really wants to speak into. So for context, if you remember a couple weeks ago when we looked at this chapter in the Gospel of Mark, Mark, Jesus' ministry is well off uh, to its start here, and he is beginning to heal the sick. Supernatural stuff is happening. People are getting delivered of demonic spirits. Uh, exorcism is happening. The power of God is flowing through Jesus in very powerful ways. And the religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, they're not denying that, right? Because it's very evident that Jesus is doing signs and wonders and miracles. And this is, I was just going to say right out the gate, we're still those crazy people that believe in the miraculous here at News. Song. The powerful thing about miracles is what they do is they press up against you and say that there is something transcendent. There is something otherworldly, that it's an actually, it's an apologetic for the existence of God. And this is how God continues to reveal himself uh, to the world through the people of God today. Like we continue to see miracles happen on a consistent basis here at New Song. This is part and parcel with the ministry of Jesus. He came preaching the gospel and modeling that the gospel message is never meant to be divine void of power as he heals the sick, raises the dead, does all sorts of really cool stuff. Now, Religious leaders aren't denying that. They're like, okay, Jesus, you got us there. You're doing some cool stuff. You're doing so. There's some power that's going. The dude that was paralyzed in Mark 2, Bobby, he was my neighbor. I saw him at the gate, you know, begging for money. And, and now he's up walking and I can't deny that that happened. What they are bringing into question is the source of Jesus's power. They're saying, this isn't God that's doing this through you. This is demonic. This is satanic. This is not good. This is evil. That's their critique. To which Jesus responds with a few parables in verse 23 that we need to pay very close attention to, says this, and he called them to him and said to them in parables. A parable is a story. It's an illustration to point us to spiritual realities and truth claims. So Jesus is speaking in parables, saying, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Now, here's the big idea that God has a kingdom and Satan has a kingdom. God has a household and a family and Satan also has a household and and a family. The scriptures are going to tell us like the family of God. All right. We've got God as father. We've got Jesus, the beloved son. We've got the spirit. We've got angels. We've got uh, Dr. Michael Heiser has been really helpful here, here in recent years, uh, helping us put language around these divine spiritual beings, these spiritual beings that all make up God's divine family. And, and what we see with God's family is it is united around the glory of God breaking into the world and God is crazy about human beings and adopting them into his family. So if you need good news right out the gate this morning, you need to know that God is a father, that he is in pursuit of you, and he has made the way by which you can enter into a reconciled relationship with himself as father through the substitutionary death of his son Jesus in your place on the cross. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but this is God's divine family. God has a household, God has a family. On the flip side of that, Satan also has a household. Satan has a family. Who does it consist of? You got Satan, you got demons, which are fallen angels. And, and, and Satan's household, this is fascinating in the text. I don't know if you saw this, but Jesus' argument, he's saying, you're coming at me, religious leaders, and saying that I'm coming from the demonic household, that you got to open up your eyes and recognize a house divided can't stand. Now, implicitly, what is he saying about the demonic household? It's not divided. Right, which can be kind of weird for us to think about in you know 2023 Western church world. That wait, that this it's like Satan's house isn't it's not divided. No, it's not. His house is united. That's why it continues to stand. It is powerful. And the question is then, what? Well, well, what? What is the demonic household oriented around? What's the mission? What's the vision? What's the target? The demonic household hates God and wants to tear down anything that would reflect His good character and nature in the world, namely your your marriage and your family. This is why, by the way, marriage can feel like war. <laughs> Because it is, right? Like there, there actually is. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, what we see is spiritual warfare. Did you know this doesn't even show up until there's a marriage? 
We don't even see spiritual warfare until God creates Adam and Eve and they get hitched up and they begin a family, right? This doesn't even, we don't even see it anywhere uh, until that actually happens in the scriptures. Now, this is the big idea. It's this, that God is building family. Satan wants to break family. And we have two opposing households with two diametrically different visions. My question for you is whose family is your family going to reflect more uh, to each other and to the world? And we got to get real clear right out the gate, everybody, because this is how you can know the work of the demonic household in the world. And it's by this, anything that would seek to undermine, redefine, reorient, or change what the biblical vision of marriage and family is, has its source not in the divine household and family, but in the demonic household and family, right? So, so the question is, you know, like, like, do you see demonic ideologies and agendas waging war against the family in our culture? Right? Like, yes, like that's literally, that, that is the moment of history that we find ourselves in. We have had incredibly influential uh, organizations over the last several years that in their founding, like statements of values and mission and purpose have said expressly that we stand for the denuclearization of the family unit. We want to take dad, remove him from the family, make government the head. Uh, we want to destabilize the nuclear family, get rid of mom, get rid of dad and, and pitch a new vision of family for society where it's more communal, it's more government led, right? This is, and this is part of the problem because that doesn't really work, does it, right? And, and in a day and an age that's calling for bigger and better government, I'm here to say, I think God's after bigger and better men, bitter, bigger and better families, bigger and better marriages, that this is really what we are looking for. I'll give you another example. Governor Inslee, our governor in Washington state just signed into law SB 5599. Uh, he signed it in in May uh, 9th and this is going to be effective July 2023. This is ridiculous. Your kid as young as 13 years old, if your parent legal guardian can leave your house if they're experiencing gender dysphoria, which is a legitimate category. We love these kids. And if this is you, you're experiencing this, man, I'm so glad that you are here. We are for you. We are not against you. But this is where demonic ideology and agenda is taking place in our state. They can leave your household without your permission, seek shelter in a government-funded facility. This is going to happen in July. And uh, the state will basically harbor your kids from you. Not con They don't have to contact you if you're not in support of their gender reassignment care. They'll give them hormone blockers, gender reassignment therapies is what they're saying as they mutilate the kids and ruin the rest of their lives in many cases for uh, many of these kids. It's, it's demonic, right? Like that's, we got to call it what it is, guys. Why? What's going on? This is a tearing down of God's good vision of marriage and of family. God gave your children to you and not to the government, right? And, and we're seeing a usurping of that authority. And somehow in our culture, what we're doing is we are refusing to to draw a line between the brokenness of culture and the brokenness of the family. And I'm telling you, it's cause and effect. You break the family, you break the culture. This is how this is how it works. That the society is built on the individual families that make it up. And so this is where a new song, we want to say, hey, listen, God's got a house. Satan's got a house. We want you in his house. And really that, and it's a house of blessing and of flourishing and togetherness and oneness and joy. And this is what, by God's grace, we're going to continue to work towards. But this is a demonic agenda, right? We've seen all the way since the beginning, guys. Like we can go all the way back to Genesis. In fact, let's do that for a second. Um, uh, you, you've got spiritual warfare happening. Like I said, when there is a marriage, I remember, you know, uh, it, it's amazing. Here's the thing. It's amazing how fast the war finds you when you get married, right? Amen. Can I get an amen from the married people? Like you get married and it's like, wow, love is a battlefield. You know, like, like here we are. I didn't know. Marissa and I, when we were engaged, it was like, man, I love you so much. Everything's going to be great. We're never going to fight. We're going to love each other. All we're going to do is it and like have fun and that's going to be it forever and it's going to be amazing. Mm, you know, when we were engaged, you know what happens? We got married. We ended up in Maui for our honeymoon in the most beautiful place on the planet, guys. We're sitting in the second story bistro. We ended up having a fight over dinner about where we were eating dinner and it just became this epic explosive fight. Keep in mind, we're in Maui, all right? Like we're at second story. It's open air. You got the sun setting. It's the most beautiful place on the planet and, and I am in this conversation with Marissa trying to figure out what would be more painful right now if I jump off of the building and run away or if I stay in this conversation right now. What's the point? The war hit fast. 
All right? And that's, that's the reality of marriage, that we don't get spiritual warfare until we actually have a marriage in the Bible. And so the question for you today that we're gonna, we're gonna answer and spend some time on is, okay, how is Satan actually still dividing households? Jesus says his house is, is united, and it's around this idea of breaking down your family. I really wanna focus mostly on marriage today, guys. I didn't mean to preach a marriage sermon today. I'm gonna be honest. It's just a amazing how when you sit down, you start writing this stuff out, it just takes off on you. And I really believe God wants to do here something. And it makes perfect sense because if hell can get your marriage to break, he can get your family to break and he can get your kids to break, right? So this is, this is the highest return on investment for the demonic household. If he can get your marriage, he can get your family, he can get the kids. And so that's where we wanna fortify at that root level of let's make your marriage strong. You might be thinking, oh, I'm single. <laughs> Listen, I'm glad you, there's gonna be a lot in here for you. I'm gonna help you figure out the kind of person that you wanna marry and the one that you don't want to marry. So this is gonna be really good for you as well. But on this idea of marriage, it is really amazing, this cultural moment that we're in. There's this whole movement uh, 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 call, you know, about like amical divorce. Have you guys heard of this? Basically, people are like, hey, it's not working. Marriage isn't working. We've got kids, so we don't want this to be super traumatic for them. Uh, so we're going to have an, uh, an amicable divorce, and people are throwing unmarried parties. <laughs> have you heard of this? It's crazy. Like, you get together instead of like a baby shower or, hey, we're getting married party. It's like, no, we're going to have an unmarried party. We're going to celebrate the fact that our family is now breaking down, and uh, we're going to do the co-parenting thing, and it's going to be great. And what happens is there is no such thing as amicable divorce amicable divorce. And in fact, the Bible is going to come around. You know what the Bible says about divorce? It's violence. It's actually violence. Marriage is like death, except nobody dies. And every time, you know, you know, you got kids, right? The family gets together for something. It's like you try to do the, you know, amicable, amicable divorce thing, the happy, you know, we're going to be friends uh, and we want the benefits of marriage and family without actually being married and family. What happens is every, every time everybody gets together, you're confronted with the dead corpse that was God's good gift of family to you. There is no such thing as uh, a, a, an amicable divorce. Some can be less messy than others, but the scripture is going to say, this is violence. You're doing violence. And here's the thing, guys. Let me just say this. For those of you that might be right here right now, if that's you, man, so glad that you're here. God obviously has your number and wants to do something in your, uh, your, your life. Uh, and, and it looks like you getting postured to receive God's power, joining God's divine family and having him break you out of the dysfunction of the moment that you find yourself in. What I, what I wanna say to you is this, it doesn't matter if your kids are four months old or 40 years old, it always affects the kids. It always affects the kids. And this is the demonic strategy. This is his telos. This is his vision for you. It's not unity, it's division. And in fact, if you look at God's vision for marriage, look at this, this is wild. Genesis chapter two, verse 24. Only Christianity gives you this, by the way, this is crazy. Therefore, a man shall leave his mom and dad and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. In fact, what happens when I work with young couples that are about to get married, we spend like a session and a half on this one verse because it's so profound, it's so deep, it's so beautiful beautiful. Uh, the first part about leaving mom and dad, a lot of couples actually don't do that. And that's where a lot of dysfunction gets brought into the family. Let me just say this, for those of you that are married, this is your immediate family. Mom and dad, uncles, aunts, sisters, brothers, cousins, they all move to the category of extended family. Your immediate family is your spouse and the children that God willing, he gives you in life. So he says, you're going to leave and you're going to be joined to your spouse and they shall become, help me now, one flesh. You're going to be one spirit, soul, body, emotions, bank accounts. Hey, oh, you know, we'll talk about that later. But your entire life becomes fused and melded together as one, right? This is the beauty of marriage. Now, here's where this gets crazy is when you jump over to Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, if you ask a Jew, what's the most important verse in the entire Bible, they would say right here, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is, help me, one. The Lord is one. He's one. Now, can I tell you something crazy? Same exact word. Genesis 2, 24, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Same word, right? This is why it's violence to end up divorced. This is a hacking of the one flesh union. Like if you have somebody, you can't chop the person in half and then they move on and flourish in life. Like it, it, it ends, it changes, right? And this is the reality. Like God is like, I, here's, here's the scandal of marriage, by the way. God is saying as I am one, 
Father, Son, and Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity. God is one. Christians are not tritheists. We're not polytheists. We are monotheists. Christianity is a monotheistic religion saying God is one, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And now God is saying, this is, this is your mission statement for marriage. And notice what it's not. It's not to be happy. Can I save you some pain in life? If you are getting married to be happy, what you, you are going to be sorely disappointed and it is coming very quickly for you. Because because what's going to happen? Add some pressure, add some money trouble, add some freaking kids, add a dog, a puppy that you bring home for some stupid reason that's going to pee on your bed and keep you awake all night. And, and, you're, and the happiness, it goes away. And you're just like, I can't stand this person anymore. Because why? Because you built your relationship on happiness. God, is his vision is so much greater than you just being happy, right? Let me save you a lot of pain. He's like, no, here's, here's, here's my vision for you in your marriage, says Jesus. I I want you to reflect the oneness of Father, Son, and Spirit to the world. Like give everybody a window into my relationship with myself, Father, Son, Spirit, Trinity, the triune God through your unity and, t- and through your oneness. That this is God's good purpose for marriage. So you can see, right? Like, like this is why the demonic strategy is to what? It's to divide you right? Because when you're divided, you are incredibly vulnerable. Just like my pastor used to say, Steve Mason, for those of you that know it, you can finish the statement with me. The place of agreement is the place of power, right? When you are in agreement, when you're one, that is incredibly powerful. When you are divided, that is a place of incredible vulnerability. God's household wants yours united in one. The demonic household wants your household, uh, or excuse me, God's household wants yours united in one. The demonic households want your house divided and separated. And these are two, uh, this is a war over your marriage and your family. And the question is, who's culture of whose house are you bringing into yours? Now, he's going to seek to divide you in a bunch of different areas. This is worth like probably a six month sermon series. I'm just going to hit a couple big ones today and make sure that you're short up here. The first thing that he wants to do, the demonic household is divide you in regard to Jesus. This is where he wants to bring division first and foremost. He wants to divide your house, your marriage, your family around Jesus. In fact, in Mark chapter three, that's what happens. You have Jesus's family of origin dividing over him. You got mom, sisters, brothers coming up, Jesus starting a new religion. They're hearing about it. They're like, you're, you're calling people to follow you. And, and they're worshiping you as God. And I changed your freaking poopy diaper. All right, like you need to come home, Jesus. Says his own biological family. They question what he, the, 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 his mission. They're divided over Jesus and what he came to do in the world. Now, here's the thing. For those of you that are single, let me talk to you for just a second because this is the most critical question that you could ever ask somebody that you're thinking about dating or getting married to. And it's, it's this, where are you at with Jesus, bro? You know, like, What do you think about him? Where are you at with Jesus? And single girls, let me tell you this. This is what you need to do. You need to not stop coming to Marissa and I and saying, hey, I met this, I met this, I love him so much. New guy, love him. With all my heart, he's amazing. Okay, yeah, tell us what you, what do you love about him? Oh, he's so cute. He's just such a cutie. He's so cute. I love him. And, and, And if this is you, sweetheart, what I would say to you is puppies and babies are cute and puppies and babies don't pay bills right? Cute doesn't pay bills. Cute is useless, all right? And and, and that's because here's the thing. If you build your marriage on happiness and cute, what happens is you get pregnant one day, you move in with the guy, you're living together, and you roll over, you look at him in the face, and all you have that you built your relationship is like, Oh, you're cute. No, he's not cute anymore, right? He's not because you're super hot, you're uncomfortable, you're growing a human and you're like, don't freaking touch me. I just need a glass of cold water. And this has not been my life the last three months with my wife about ready to pop a kid out at all. That's not what I'm saying. But you know, like if you build your, thank God she didn't build her relationship with me on taste cute, you know, (laughs) that wasn't what, or else we'd just be done because this is impossible to do if that's your, if that's your end, right? But this is what, this is the most important question, right? It's, it's why, are you interested in this person? Is it because they provoke you to love Jesus more? Right? That's what you're looking for. In fact, with all my sisters, it's like they come to me at one point and they're like, well, how do I do this? You know, it's like, okay, here's, here's what you're looking for. Let me make it super simple. You're looking for somebody that loves Jesus more than you. 
You're looking for somebody that's gonna provoke you in your relationship with Jesus and not put a wedge there. Because if, if you do that right, really, ultimately, we can figure everything else out. Uh, but it's this question of, you know, should I date and marry a non-Christian, right? Let's spend some, a couple more minutes on this, right? Because this is something that everybody uh, often asks, you know, like, hey, I met this person, I'm really interested in them. Uh, I think they're pretty cute. And, uh, but they don't know Jesus. They don't love Jesus. They're not a follower of Jesus. But I think that maybe I could be the one that brings them around. I can't, t- guys, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard, I'd, I'd have like 80 bucks. All right, probably. Like, uh, and, right, like just so often. And, and you want to know how many times I've seen that work out? Zero. It never works. Why? Because here's the point. The two most important decisions that you are ever going to make in life is number one, who you worship, and number two, who you wed. Most important decisions that you will ever make in your life. It's not what car, what house, where are you going to live? No, 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 no. Way more important than that. Who are you going to worship and who are you going to wed? And here's the point. If you are not in agreement with this person who you are thinking about uh, wedding, marrying, of of who you're going to worship, you are divided at the most base fundamental layer of any relationship possible. And and Jesus is going to to come around and say a house divided can't stand. You're divided. If you are divided with the person who you're going to wed on who you worship, you are setting yourself up for a lot of pain. Why? And I've seen this happen so many times. Why? It's like Jesus does something amazing in your life. You can't share that. Like, oh God, God did this amazing thing in my life, my group, my church. Man, we're seeing all this great stuff. You can't share that. It's a place of incredible pain and also confusion for the kids because you got one parent that's like, God exists. The other's like, no, it doesn't. You know, mom's crazy. It's like the joke of the kid, you know, went to the, uh, uh, dad and uh, was like, hey, dad, where'd we come from? Dad was like, came from monkeys, all right? Came from monkeys, the monkeys made us. Kid goes back to the mom, says, mom, uh, I'm confused because you said that God made us and dad said that we came from monkeys. And the mom looks back and says, no, 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 sweetheart. Daddy's confused. He's talking about his side of the family. You know, like, that's just who he's talking about. We, we did come from God. All right, so it's confusing. That's the point because you got one parent saying God exists. The other one's saying, no, he doesn't. One's saying Jesus is God. The other's, no, he's not. The one's saying we love the Bible. The other one's saying the Bible's trash, good stuff in there, but not God's word, holy, trustworthy, and true. It is incredibly confusing for the kids. Kids. And ultimately what happens is if you're not agree- in agreement there, uh, how are they going to trust you? You don't agree about the most critical, important questions of, all of life. Now, let me take the pressure off here for just a second and say a couple things. Number one, if you're in that situation right now with kids, I want to say God's grace is for you. He is for you. And we want to be your spiritual family here in such a way that says, hey, we we understand there's some pain in your family. Maybe you're divorced. Maybe you're separated. Uh, Dad's not a believer. Wife or mom isn't a believer. Whatever it is, we want to be your family, rally around you and give your kids a crazy reason to believe that Jesus really is who he says that he is. And and the other thing, I want to take the pressure off of married people here for just a second. Uh, I was talking with my wife and she was like, last night we were sitting by the fire kind of praying for everybody here today in our services. And she was like, hey, it's a little intense, you know, like, like maybe get some more Holy Spirit in there, you know? And so that's what I want to put some grace on you here just a second and say this. Can I just remind you, Jesus cares so much more about your marriage than you do, right? He, he cares so much more about your future marriage than you do. He cares so much more about your family than you do. He cares so much more about your future family than you do. And he is setting you up and us up to succeed and not to fail. But if you're ultimate, if you're divided at that level of who, who do we worship with the person that you wed, you're setting yourselves up for fame. This is why husbands and dad, dads, the, the scriptural vision for your role, uh, it, it's, it's, it's your job, our job to say, you know what? Jesus is going to stay the center. We are not going to divide over Jesus. We're going to lovingly lead and serve our families. Go first, go low, go again. This is why, by the way, in Genesis 1, when Adam and Eve sin, question for you, a little Bible trivia, who sins first, Adam or Eve? This isn't a trick question. Who sins first? F, you guys got it. That took so long. No, you're, you're right. You're right. It was Eve. Right? Not a trick question, but Eve sinned first. All right, so we're going to go back to, you know, nursery. I'm going to put you guys all over there. We're going to go learn Genesis 1 all over again. But you, all right, Eve sinned first. She did. She ate the tree. And here's the fascinating three thing. Who did God come looking for first? Was it Eve or was it Adam? 
It was Adam. Adam, where are you? Meaning what? And guys, this has been the bane of your existence ever since. Even if it's not your fault, it's your fault. That's the point, okay? So you just gotta suck it up and deal with it, right? But, but he, he, God is saying, listen, right? Like both people responsible for their individual sin, both co-leadership, yes, that's a thing, but to Adam, he's saying, you have a heightened level of responsibility to make sure that your family is healthy and flourishing, and it's not being divided by the demonic household, but it's being blessed by the divine household. Like, that's ultimately your responsibility and my responsibility. And let me just say this to you guys who are here right now. Your wives are under your arms, and you got your kids with you in church. I want to say, you're the reason I have hope for tomorrow. Like you are a freaking miracle and you are a hero. And I am so incredibly grateful to God and I, I, that you're here, that you're at New Song. And I, I just want you to know as your pastor, I am a champion of you and we are a champion of you here at New Song. I want to support, you got an impossible task and you got a lot of critics. And uh, I want to remind you that God is a father and he doesn't come with critique, but with blessing. And you can do this. You really can. We really believe that God has given you your family and uh, equipped you to lead and to love and to serve at that level. And, and you're doing a great job. So keep going and don't listen to all the noise around you. Let's just keep following Jesus together and serve and loving the people that are closest to us. This is God's vision for you and for me. In addition to this, here's, I've teased this idea out, but I wanna spend some more time on it. Pivot here to this idea. Uh, we wanna look at some culture. How do you tell where the culture of your home is in regard to God's house or the demonic house? Here's what you need to understand. God's household is a household of blessing and Satan's household is a household of cursing. God's house is a house of blessing. The demonic household is a household of cursing. That God does blessing, Satan does cursing. God does building up, Satan does breaking down. This is how it's always worked. Now, here's the scary part for you and me. Uh, for those of you that are married and you have a family, uh, every single day through your actions, through the words that you say, through your interactions with your spouse, uh, your family, you are either doing one one of two things, bringing the culture of the divine household in, or you're bringing the culture of the demonic household in. No neutral ground. You are either through your everyday actions, decisions, interactions with your spouse, with your kids, with your family, person you're dating, right? Whatever. Right? You, you are either bringing God's house of blessing in or the demonic house of cursing in. So question for you is whose house does yours more clearly reflect? Now, this is why, by the way, anger can be so destructive. I told you guys before, I'm Irish and I'm Scottish, which means basically I'm mad at myself all the time. <laughs> you know, like that's, it's just, it's just how, how it works. Like, and, and, and this is why anger can be so destructive, right? Uh, because anger becomes rumination, becomes rage, becomes cursing. It doesn't become blessing, right? That's the point. And, and you end up uh, actually giving Satan a foothold. Look at Ephesians chapter four, verse 26 and 27. Crazy passage. He says this, Paul says this, be angry and do not sin. How many know that you can be angry and not sin? That not all anger is sin and bad anger. And in fact, in the spectrum of the emotional experience of God, we find all throughout the scriptures that God experiences anger. Uh, should you be angry about bad things that happen to people in the world to hurt them? Yes, you should be angry about that. If there is an outside threat coming against your family, your marriage, your kids, should you be passive about that? Nah, it's no big deal. Or should you be angry and care about that? You should be angry and you should deeply care about that, right? So you can, you can be angry, just don't sin. That's what God is saying. And in fact, God experienced, in fact, fascinating moment in Jesus's life where uh, he deserves like a spot on an MTV show or something. He shows up to the temple. He finds God's house of prayer turned into a den of robbers. People are marking up sacrifices for profit. These people are exploiting God's people for money. And uh, what does he do? He fashions a whip guys. And he starts like, whoosh, you know, whipping fools and flipping over tables. Why? Because he's angry. He's saying, this is not what my house is supposed to look like. So you can be angry. God's just like, don't sin. And he goes on, it gets better. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Can I tell you this? Today's anger isn't a problem. It's yesterday's anger that you still have. That's the problem. 
That's what Paul's saying here. It's not, yet, it's not today's anger that's an issue. No, no, no. It's yesterday's anger that you are still going, holding on to. And many of you, that's why the culture of your home is so cold, why it's so uh, heavy, uh, and why it's so broken is because you're not just holding on to a fence from yesterday, but last month, last year, five years ago, God forbid, decades past, right? And you're holding on to that. And what does he say? You've given opportunity to the devil. You have given him a foothold. And here's what happens. The foothold becomes a stronghold, becomes a chokehold, becomes a death hold. And that's what, and so here's what Jesus wants to do in your life, in your marriage today. He wants to say, all right, culture of cursing, we're going to break that and bring you into the culture of blessing. This is what God wants to do in your life. And in fact, this is fascinating. Uh, I was thinking about this last little bit here. Uh, every marriage that I have seen deteriorate, every uh, affair that I have seen happen, every area of massive major brokenness in the home between husband and wife, you know what it always comes down to? It's a lack of warmth a lack of tenderness, a lack of blessing, a lack of intimacy, a lack of friendship, that it's this idea that way before you fall out of love, you really did fall out of warmth. This is what happens. And ruminating in that held on to anger will increase that. And then the cursing starts. You know, you're a horrible person. I can't stand you. Just wish you'd die. So bitter towards you. I can't stand you as a person. You are disgusting to me. And, 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 right? Like that's the culture of cursing, right? Like this, this happens. I, I got you guys in my office. Like I know this, it, this happens that many of us, we experience this. And so the question is then, that, okay, how, do, how, how can I be helpful here? The question is, how do you go from a culture of cursing to a culture of blessing, let me save you a lot of pain. You're not going to get from the culture of cursing to the culture of blessing by more cursing. How do you know that that's the case? You can't out curse your way into a house of blessing. It just doesn't work like that. You have to come in a completely different spirit. And this is why, by the way, the Bible is the greatest marriage counseling book that's ever been written in the history of humanity. Peter's going to come around and first Peter is going to say this phenomenal, fascinating idea. He's going to say this, don't return evil for evil, right? Because what happens, I mean, think about it in your marriage, bro, when your spouse does something, says something dumb and hurts you, do you want to do what Peter Peter is saying, no, what do you want to do? You want to return evil for evil. You're like, you're the disaster here. You know, like, that, don't act like you haven't been there. And so what happens is you begin ratcheting it up. And so it gets more hurtful and more painful. And all of a sudden now we are in a demonic competition to see who can come out on top, who can have the last word, the final word, and be the most hurtful. This is how couples end up in the divorce court, right? It's because you've got a culture of cursing and you're not going to get out of the culture of cursing with more cursing. How do you get out of it? Culture of blessing. You become a household of blessing, right? This is God's good design for uh, you and what he wants to do in your heart and uh, in your marriage. Now, uh, if, it, if that shift doesn't happen, then destructive patterns, let's take this a little bit deeper here. Destructive patterns really begin to develop. Another thing, one of my favorite things that Steve always used to say also is the devil takes people captive by the predictability of human behavior. That every marriage has destructive tendencies and patterns. So for some of you, it's gonna be, you know, uh, explosive anger, cussing each other out, hate you, can't stand you, what's wrong with you, and never wanna see you again. Some of you, it's not hurtful words. It's you try to hurt your spouse not speaking to them with the abstinence of words. I'm going to go passive bitterness. I'm going to go inward. I'm going to shut down. I'm going to isolate. You don't try necessarily to hurt your spouse with words, but with a lack of words. You spend your time in your garage getting all these other hobbies. Self-isolate, right? It's a bad thing and it doesn't work. Some of you, let's be real, you're just a nag. You just nag all of the time. Let me, let me say this. Let me save you a bunch of pain on this idea. Uh, here's the deal. Nagging is verbal napalm. All right? It is. It, it always breaks down and destroys. It never builds up. I have never had a couple come to me and say, hey, listen, here's the thing. My spouse just nagged me for so many years, so many, so many, so many years. And I finally came to the conclusion, I am as horrible as a person as they think I am and they say that I am. And I'm ready to get help and change. Like, it just doesn't happen, right? It's a culture of cursing. And so here's what you got to do, right? Here's part of the application for married people is you got to figure out where are we at in regard to passivity? Where are we at in regard to nagging? 
And, and you got to put the referee shirt on the other person and let them tell you how it's going. And then by God's grace, we're going to say together, get united around. This is, this is bringing in the demonic household in our household. And let's pivot here. Let's get active. Let's be proactive. And let's speak words of life and encourage each other uh, into following Jesus and being a household that more reflects his. That's what we're going to do. Now, Paul gets at this idea. Let's get uh, even a little bit maybe more practical of what that could look like here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, this is amazing. Master class on relationships. He says this, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit. That's another dollar in the swear jar word in the West right now, isn't it? It's like, no, I'm not going to submit to you, fool. I'm an American. I don't submit to anybody, right? But he's saying, no, submit to each other. You want a marriage that works? This is what you need to do. Now, let me try to make it a little bit less offensive. You want to know what Paul's saying? Lean in for a second. He's saying, you want to flourish in your marriage? You want health? You want the culture of blessing instead of the culture of cursing? You want warmth? You want togetherness? Nobody gets in marriage to you know, end in it broken and up in fire. Nobody does that. You want to flourish in your marriage? This is what Paul's saying. Let me put this idea of submitting to one another in different words. He's saying this, race to the back of the line for each other. Do that all the time. Race to the back of the line for each other. Right? And when Marissa and I are at our best, we are doing this. When we are at our worst, we are not doing this. Because when you race to the back of the line for the other person, you're doing the exact opposite of retaliation. You are taking the lowest place, the lower place, the position of service, of humility, of we are moving in a bad direction in our relationship right now. I'm going to course correct us. We're going to be a house of blessing and not a house of cursing. You got to race each other to the back of the line. Let me just say this. My wife is nine months pregnant and she is Never been more slow than she is right now, right? So it's not that difficult to beat her there. But this is, this is the point. How can I get to the back of the line for you right now? In my words, when stuff is really good, you're like, hey, praise God, stuff is great right now. How can I race to the back of the line? When stuff is bad, that's when it's a little bit more difficult, but it's the same thing. How can I race to the back of the line for you right now? If you could bring a question into your every week, every day rhythms with your spouse that would keep you united uh, around God's vision for your household, keeping the demonic culture out, I guarantee you that question is going to get you there. So you want to get pragmat this for you pragmatists, right? Here's your application. Do that, all right? Every day. How can I race to the back of the line for you right now? Because, and he says, out of reverence for Christ, meaning what? That that's how Jesus lives, right? This is what Jesus does. How can he have grace to do that? Because he always goes to the lowest place for you even when you don't deserve it. He continues to come in service and servant love for you and for me all the time. And as we experience that, we can race to the line, to the back of the line for our, our, our spouses and our kids. All right, let me close with this thought, everybody. Worship team, community team, go ahead and come on up. So how are we gonna keep Satan from dividing your family? All of that, but most importantly, let me say this. How are you gonna do this? You're gonna join Jesus's family. For many of you, this is what you need more than anything. You're, you're actually not a part of Jesus's household. You're not a part of the divine household. You're not a part of God's family. And what I would say to you is this is what you need more than anything. You need to join God's family. And here's, here's the problem, right? Because many of you, you, you never had a good example of what a family was supposed to look like, right? Like it was just, it was rough beans. Like, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of unhealth. And uh, you get married and you get your own family. And it's just like, I don't know what the crap to do with this because I've never seen it work well, you know? And so you just sort of try to fumble forward and it just doesn't work and you end up repeating the same unhealth of the home that you grew up in. And here's the beauty of uh, following Jesus is when you surrender your life to Christ, repent of sin and trust yourself to him, past, present and future, you get a new family where God becomes your father. Jesus becomes older brother. Holy Spirit comes as helper. You get a spiritual family. Family, the people of God, full of a bunch of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to help steward and shape and cultivate and encourage your family towards flourishing, right? This is, this is God's good design. And so you, maybe you're here and you're just, you need to make that decision to say, okay, listen, I'm going to actually join God's family. This is the most important thing that you could, uh, most important decision that you could uh, make today. Now, this is really offensive for a couple of reasons. Number of them, uh, one of them would be this, that it means that not everybody is automatically a child of God. Because if you got a 
become a part of God's family, it means that you are not automatically positionally a part of his family. But here's the good news of the gospel, guys. Jesus came. He lived as the one true son, as the faithful son, the perfect son with whom the father is well pleased, who died the death of you and I, the the ones, the kids that ran away and squandered the inheritance. He became the criminal on the cross so he could give you and I his identity, his position as son to the Father. Now, here's, here's the amazing thing about what happens when you give your life to Christ. You, you get a new family. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says it this way. This is amazing, that God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And this is the beauty of the communion table, guys, because what we're saying every single week is you take communion, you're reminded, if you're a believer, the adoption papers have been signed. God is your Father. And can I tell you this, that he is crazy about you right now. He loves you. He is for you. He is in pursuit of your heart. And the amazing thing, when we look at this idea of adoption through the lens of the cross, broken body, shed blood of Jesus, we find that your adoption papers, let me close with this thought, was not signed with ink, but with blood which means infinitely more costly and infinitely more permanent. Can I tell you, you are not on shaky ground with God if you are a follower of Jesus. God is your father. He is not walking out on you. He does blessing. He does not do cursing. And as you come forward and you take communion today, I want you to hear the father just speaking his blessing over you. You, my son, you're my daughter. I'm well pleased with you because of what Jesus has done for you. Would you stand with me? Let me pray for us to that end. God, I thank you that you are a good father. I pray. Jesus, that you would come and minister to your people this morning. I pray, Lord, where there uh, are and where there's been cursing spoken by ourselves or by others or even by a spouse, Lord, I thank you that you are speaking blessing right now. You come to bless, you don't come to curse. And, And just like the language of the New Testament is gonna say about the communion cup, that it's the cup of blessing not a cup of cursing, that Jesus drank the cup of cursing so we could take the cup of blessing. And Lord, we just thank you for our adoption papers that have been signed. And I'm a son and you love me, you're for me. And the papers are signed not with ink, but with the blood of Jesus. It's permanent, it's costly. We are not on shaky ground in your house today. And as we take communion, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would just drive that deep into the souls of everybody here. And as we encounter your heart as Father who is speaking blessing, that we would then be positioned to model that for our spouses, for our marriages, and for our families that we uh, leave here to spend some time with today. In Jesus' name, God, I pray if there's anybody here who hasn't made that decision to uh, join your family. God, that they would make that decision today to say, I don't want to be an orphan anymore. I am looking for God. I am looking for uh, what we are talking about today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace and the supernatural ability to recognize I'm a sinner. I need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. Lord, what you said in John 14 still rings true today, that you are the only way to the Father pray that you'd give them grace to understand that that's the case today. And you're saying, hey, come freely by me. I want to heal you. I want to save you. I want to bring you into the household and the family of God. This is who you're looking for. What you're looking for. Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody, we're going to take communion together. Go ahead. You know the drill. Exit to the left. Come forward. Grab your emblems. Return to your seat. If you're here, you're not a follower of Jesus. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stay seated. So glad that you came here. Uh, Nobody's going to think anything different of you. This is just a moment for us who identify as followers of Jesus to remember and celebrate what we're talking about today. That through his life, his death, his resurrection, we're reconciled to the family of God and uh, celebrate that good work in our lives every week. This is why we do this. If if you're here, you're saying, I'm not a Christian. I'm ready to become one. 
I want in on that. I would love to pray with you. I'm going to be over here to my right and your left and uh, would love you to get introduced to uh, Jesus today and serve you your first communion. We're going to enjoy a moment in God's presence as the worship team leads us in the final song.